such a pleasure to be here with all of you. So we are in this virtual space, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from Chicago, Illinois, the traditional homeland of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ottawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi Nations. I acknowledge that I reside, dance, and come to you on stolen lands that are ancestral sites of healing, trade, and travel for more than a dozen tribes. Before we begin, I invite everyone to take a few deep breaths together. You can close your eyes or look away from the screen for a moment if that is accessible, accessible for you. So take a moment to settle into your space. I like to have my feet and my sit bones flat on whatever surface they're sitting on or standing. Just take a deep inhale. And exhale. One more time, inhale. And exhale. Last one, really deep, inhale. And exhale. You can slowly open your eyes again. And come back to join us as a space. I'd just like to center us before we begin this conversation with breathing together. Since although we're in the virtual space, we're still all collectively together. And I do want to remind you that you are more than welcome to experience this workshop in any and discussion in any way you would like, sitting, standing moving around just to be comfortable in your body while Petra and I are chatting today. So Petra Kupper is a disability culture activist, a wheelchair dancer, and a community performance artist. She creates participatory community performance environments that think, feel into public space, tenderness, site-specific art, access, and experimentation. Petra grounds herself in disability culture methods and uses ecosomatics, performance, and speculative writing to engage audiences towards more socially just and enjoyable futures. She teaches at the University of Michigan in performance studies and disability culture and is also an advisor on the low residency MFA in interdisciplinary arts at Goddard College. She is the artistic director of the Olympias an international disability culture collective and co-creates Turtle Disco, a somatic writing studio with her wife, poet and dancer, Stephanie Help. Hey, sorry. On their home in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And with that, I'm going to let Dr. Petra Kuppers introduce herself. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Hi, I am Petra, she, her. And I am a large white woman with uh, a shaved head and yellow glasses. I'm wearing a green top with a silver geometrical design on it. And I have nice black lipstick on just for you. And behind me is a red painted wall and a beautiful rug in different kind of colors of orange and red. So, um, and on the other side here is a, is a, a painting that you can't quite see, but it's a reclining nude uh, as is appropriate for a queer household like ours. So, and I'm really glad to be here with you. I come from Ypsilanti, Michigan. This is Turtle Disco. And we are just like Sydney here on Nishinaabe territory. So, and I'm honoring the, both the, um, the traditional and the current people who hold this land. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. This is Sydney. Throughout our talk today, I also forgot to mention that we will be pasting in links into the chat to Petra's work that we will be discussing as we go. So Petra, I'm so excited to be talking to you today and I'm honored to be here and have the privilege to interview you and have a short discussion. So disability arts and culture scholar, Petra, I'm wondering if we could begin by having a quick discussion of the definition of disability arts and culture and some places where you see this emerging, especially for those who might not be familiar with the terms. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much. And by the way, I really loved your introduction. And I just want to echo that for when, whenever I'm presenting, I will have, I have a little PowerPoint that I'm going to move around in, in order to answer some of the questions. But I read everything and audio describe everything that's on those slides. So if you want to just chill out, lie down, whatever, that's totally fine. So yeah, disability culture. Thank you for that lovely question. Let me share the screen to give you my little miniature definition. Okay, I'm going to find this thing here. There you go. Is that all nicely visible to you? Yes, excellent. So here's really, this is what, so I'm having here a slide on which is my name and my email address. And I put in the Olympias and Total Disco, which are the two collectives that I am. Um, I have been part of for many, many years, over 20 years now. And for me, disability culture refers to the arts and culture created by disabled people, where we share pain and pleasure, heft and depth. Okay, so it's a very, it's a pretty straight up definition for something that is not straight up at all. D disability culture is also a pie in the sky. It's also a, it's a, it's a castle, it's a, it's a dream, it's something that, um, that doesn't quite exist because most of us do not necessarily automatically identify with disability culture and disability justice approaches. So we all come with multiple identities to this thing we call disability culture. So I acknowledge that too. It's not really a thing and yet it's really a thing. I mean, in practice, if you roll or walk into a space where there's lots of disabled people, you usually get a really quick sense of acceptance and being with, you know, people don't stare at you because you're different. If I wheel myself into a disability culture poetry reading or a dance performance, I don't have dancers that think that I'm, I'm highly fragile or completely unable, you know, just because I happen to have a wheelchair. They, they kind of, they just engage with me as the kind of body that I am, which is a large body and it's a body that uses mobility devices, but a body that can be really lyrical, elegant and happy dancing on the ground. Okay, that's a moment of disability culture for me when people accept me for who I am. They can be disabled or non-disabled, but I do tend to find that in disability culture settings, settings that are under that label of disability culture, there is more of an acceptance. I don't have to prove anything just by rolling onto that workshop floor or onto that stage. Does that make sense? That's the that end was of my very talk. beautiful. Thank you. This is Sydney. That was very beautiful. It was very succinct. I have read many of your texts and used a lot of other of your definitions of disability culture. And I really like how you succinctly tied it all together. And I really like this moment where you describe pain and pleasure, because I think that's so important, especially because dance, right, is an embodied practice and that's part of the experience. And I think it's part of the experience even more for those who identify as disabled and also experience pain. And I know for me, part of dancing is it's really painful sometimes, but it's also really pleasurable. And I think it's even more pleasurable to experience the pain when you're in those communities, like you described, where if you need to take the class line on the ground, it's fine or mm -hmm. the whole class seated. So very exactly. beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, this is Petra. I mean, particularly those moments when I'm in a non-disabled person's workshop and I know I can do it. I just can't do it exactly the way that the the teacher wants us to do it. You know, I just can't do the sidestep. If you're in a wheelchair, you can't do a sidestep. It's pretty straight up. You can't do it, right? I mean, you just can't just hop around sideways with a wheelchair. Um, so, um, and I know that if I have time to figure out what the whole choreography is, I can find a really good way around it. In a non-disabled space, when, when, for instance, when steps are given, there's not often that time. So I find myself sitting out, even though I really don't need to. You know, I wouldn't need to if the person leading would lead from an accessible place. That doesn't preclude steps and set choreographies. It just means tell us what the point is, what you want, the, the, what you want to happen, and then we'll find a way to access it. So that's part of this, this kind of... Disability culture, you know, uh, dance leading can be from a disability culture place. And that might also include at times tears, right? I mean, when there is something that you really can't do, there are things I really can't do, even with the best, you know, accessible dance in the world. 
there's just certain things I'd love to do, but I cannot do. And, and sometimes things get activated in my personal history. This happens to non-disabled dancers just as much as disabled dancers, right? I mean, if we all have bodies that shift and change and I'm by now, I did say I had white hair, didn't I? So I'm, I'm getting older. So dancers my age, even if they started out non-disabled at this point, have tears when certain things are just not possible. Um, in a disability culture setting, there's a space to hold that. You know, there's a space to acknowledge that bodies and pain also go together. There are limits to things. And yet we can still have really wonderful times together and dance together. So that's, those are two other elements of disability culture in accessible dance settings. And that's the end of my thought. Thank you, Petra. This is Sydney again. So we've talked a little bit about dance, but I want to delve in a little bit more into your dance practice. One of the first times I met you in person was at a conference where you took us all outside instead of being in these uh, dark conference rooms and classrooms, and you wanted us to go outside and enjoy the sun and move together. And when I had this opportunity to talk to you, I really wanted to know about how has nature or site-specific work been important to your movement practice? And why is this public presentation so important as a disabled artist? Thank you. I think it's a lovely question. So this is Petra again. And I'm gonna once again, go to a slide. Because I actually have a slide that answers at least some of that. And then I'm gonna circle back and answer other elements. But I think slides are fun. So let's go to this. Oh, wait. It's always a different step when you go to this and this and this and this and this. OK. So now I have a slide in front of you. I just wrote down some of the things I'm going to say, because sometimes it's just good to have it in front of you. And those are my lineages. And they begin to address some of these issues of why I do take people outside, why that's so important to me. My lineage is that I, I grew up in Germany, so you might have heard from my accent that I am German. I'm, and I'm, here I'm reading from the slides, so you have it there. I'm, I grew up in Germany in the 1970s and the 80s, and that meant that um, I had to engage with um, the Nazi and colonial past, Germany's Nazi and colonial past, and what it, meant, what it means to come from a perpetrator nation, from a nation that has perpetrated atrocity. So that's a significant element of my, my way of being in the world and me doing work in the world. So that includes being, being public as different bodies, being public out in the open. I also grew up on the Niederrhein, where I grew up with a very deep sense of the aliveness of the natural world of creatures in the forest and rivers in my environment. So when I was a little one, I, I was just, I knew that there were creatures in the little river that's near, that flows near my house. You know, I just, it was, and, and in the forest, there were all kinds of creatures. And it, it wasn't something that I had to read about later. It just was part of the gift of growing up in my home space. And the other thing I hear is that growing up in pain, um, I had to find disability culture, you know, so as I described it already, it's, it's, it's not really a thing. We're making it together. It's like a tentative thing. Uh, we're making up new art forms, and these are often outdoors, often in public. And they, by being outdoors and by being in public, they challenge ideas of disability. You now we're using methods of joy, community, of trance and mystery. And I might have to explain trance. So with trance, I mean the kind of states that you get into when you repeat something or when you say self-soothing. So in, in autistic culture, it's stimming, right? When you, when you hold something, those of us who here who are neurodiverse might know about, or even if you're not neurodiverse, you might know the pleasure of just touching, say a piece of fabric or touching your hair or you know, adjusting something on your face, those kinds of stimming things. And I'm sure many people here know that. I invite you to just do your stim right now, if you have one, do your stim. If you do this, you can self-soothe. And if you do this a lot, you can also get into a trans state, into an altered state, when you perceive the world differently, when things become a little bit more open towards these other influences, beyond human influences. You can be influenced by birds and trees, by the water lapping on the shore. You know, there are all these other ways in which you can open yourself up to the world. And that is for me also part of why I'm, I'm going outdoors. I'm going to stop the share now. OK. 
Okay, so now it's back to me on the screen. So those are all the reasons why, why I do what I do. And I, I also think that disabled people have been kept out of public sight in many places. You know, disabled people have been kept hidden. And there's not a lot of access to the kinds of beautiful natural spaces that many of us love to go into. So by doing actions in national parks, by going into state parks, by going into public spaces, by hanging out at the local here, just around the corner, our little local playground, and showing disabled people as having fun together, moving together, enjoying themselves, it's a significant intervention into what disability means in the public sphere. And that's the end of my thought. And I'm saying this, that's the end of my thought. That's a, it's an access provision that I've come across in Canadian contexts. And I really like it because it helps people to build a rhythm in Zoom worlds, right? Where it's very hard to know who gets to speak. Um, and it's very hard to kind of figure out, well, at which point do I get in, particularly if you don't automatically read all the social cues. So hence, it's an access provision. So I say, this is the end of my thought. Thank you for that again, Petra. This is Sydney. I really enjoy the ways that you are talking about just being out in public. I know um, with my dance group here, we hadn't met since before the beginning of the pandemic passed it back in March and we just met up to socially distance and mask, meet in a park and create a short dance film. And it really was beautiful. And we were dancing right next to a playground and just being together and seeing so many diverse bodies and different forms of body mind and body mind. I think it really says something about the community and it really says something about saying we belong here and we are, you're right, like this fun, this play, so many people mm -hmm. stopped to watch just because we were having so much fun being together. And I think that's just really lovely. And it really does, I think, put a little bit of disability culture on show for the larger community. I agree. This is Petra saying, I agree. Thank you. It's the end of my thought. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit more, this is Sydney again, about one of your projects that I recently was able to read about and I've also been following online. And this is the Salamander Project. And here you traveled around the world to swim with other disabled people. And I'm wondering, we'll put a link in the chat for everyone to check out the Salamander Project, but I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the project. Lovely, thank you. Yes, so in, um, in 2013, so quite a little while ago now, um, I, my, my partner at the time, Neil Marcus, who's a disabled dance artist from the Bay Area, really well-known disability dance elder, beautiful, beautiful man. He, um, he's spastic and he needed to move a bit more as, as, so, as so many of us need to. So his doctors told him, you've got to move more. And, but he didn't really want to. He didn't like exercise, right? But he loves performing and he loves performing for the camera. So we came up with a structure that allowed him to do exercise that's good for him and perform to the camera because we bought an underwater camera, a small, really cheap underwater camera. And we took that to the pool with us. And then we just made, a, made photos of each other underwater. We, we started inviting friends, made more photos. The camera was just handed around from one hand to the next. You know, there's no photographer making portraits because when you're down there, in the, in the water at the bottom of your breath, you can't see anything, you know, and it's all like all topsy-turvy, it's all weird. So we just made kind of more or less random photos. And then I, later on after the sessions, I would then go and look at those images and maybe manipulate them a little bit, get them clearer and, and then share them in a different pool. That was the Facebook pool, you know, this kind of other international swirl, swirl watery swirl. So I, I showed these images to people and let them audio describe those images. So we got this beautiful archive of, I mean, I have hundreds of people probably a thousand people, I don't know, maybe not a thousand, hundreds and hundreds of people from so many dives together. Um, and later on, I took that project then to many other places. Um, and I managed to swim off, off coasts in Australia, you know, on white coasts, white 
beautiful beaches in Australia. Uh, we swam in a river that had that might or might not have t- uh, sharks in it. So it's like, ooh, st- very scary, but very, very, very amazing, you know, like in the middle of an Australian jungle. Uh, swam in Aotearoa, swam in Sweden. We were in this, off, on this beautiful um, island just off the coast of Gothenburg in Sweden in 2016 and did a salamander there. So we just, in the salamander, there's not really much of a score, right? It's just basically, we go into the water together and move freely as much as our bodies allow. And at some point, if we want to, and we don't have to, we don't want to, but if we want to, we just, we dive under and just go together to that place at the bottom of our breath, which is a very vulnerable place, right? I mean, at at this point, we probably have chatted quite a bit, have gotten to know each each other a little bit. We've been floating semi-nude together and there we go, we're taking off our breath, this whole intimate connection going on in that moment at this edge of life and death. So, so that's what I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, yeah, and then we also came up with audiencing procedures, for instance, for the Swedish Salamander. I did go to Gothenburg um, three times, I think, for this project. And in one of these projects, we, we swam in a beautiful thermal bath in, um, in Gothenburg, a gorgeous old thermal bath and, and the dance company had invited me, we would go under together in this bath and learned how to do um, so, uh, something like contact improvisation underwater, which was amazing. You know, just, we just had nose clips. So this was like, not what we do in our everyday salamander. This was like a, towards the performance. And this was with a dance company Spin in, in Gothenburg, which some of you might know. It's a, it's an integrated dance company. So we, we taught ourselves to do contact underwater with nose clips and goggles and really just use the momentum of water and the momentum of our bodies to move in very different ways with one another. And then when we were on the, on the final, the actual performance involved a walk on the island. So this kind of outdoor activity that we've already been describing, we were walking slowly and had stations where we invited people to sit and look out at the ocean. We had stations where people just sat and touched lichen on a rock, just gently touching lichen. And then eventually we invited the audience to drop their own clothes. They had their bathing suits on, get into the pool with us. And then we danced with them in the pool with us. And I know my comp- other companies have done this too. And I think it's just the most beautiful thing. I mean, it's, I just couldn't think of a more delicious thing than performing together in a circle in the water, holding each other, everybody unsure, all steps unclear. There's, you know, the distinctions between who is disabled and who's non-disabled very quickly vanish when you are, you know, in this very unstable element of the water. It was very beautiful. Yay. And I did bring some pictures along if you want to look at those together. Sydney, does that sound good? Go there. Yeah, and I think we can come back to questions. We're actually running a little bit behind as it is, so I think that's the perfect transition. Oh, okay. Sure, you want to go? Yeah, let's go to the pictures for one or two. All right, I'm going to share the screen. Okay, so I'm going to first share with you a picture of this of the co-founder. So this is Neil Marcus, the co-founder of the project. And I did put a little bit of who these people are on the slide. So it says here, Neil Marcus, he, him, a spastic poet, dancer, philosopher from the Bay Area and the project co-founder. And next to him is Chia Yi C2, she, her, a Beijing-based dance artist. And what I do in my presentations is I invite the audience, you all, to audio describe what you're seeing to give the people who don't see a good, an idea of what is on the screen, but also to show us all how audio description itself can be a form of aesthetic access. It is an access provision, but it also shows something about the diversity of how we all see. So if you're all up to that, I would love some of you, if you like to, to unmute yourself and to speak what it is that you're seeing in this image. Would maybe one or two people be volunteers to start this up? What do you see? We're going to do a communal audio description. I I see um, a suspension of time and space and um, also expansion through the medium of the water. And um, 
the one one dancer is is a, a strong focus in a certain direction, and the other dancer has their eyes closed, so that's an inner. So they're they're portraying very different um, qualities, but they're both immersed within the same essence. Oh, Sally, that is a beautiful description. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's do a different one. Let's see. Next slide. Okay, so this is a, one of the setups. So here we have a slide that has no words on it. It just shows a group of people by the side of a pool. Um, and it's a hotel pool. So you have all these, these chairs and uh, deck chairs there with, with orange covers on them. And can someone audio describe what they're seeing here? This is a preparation for a salamander. Sydney, do you want to give that one a try? I'd love to. Thanks for asking, Petra. Thank you. So I see many people in swimsuits, different colored swimsuits, laying down on, um, I forget what they're called, like beach chairs, lawn, yeah, lawn loungers. Exactly. Yeah. And they're with their red cushions and other people are dressed professionally in dresses and business clothes that are leaning over them. Some of them are rubbing the swimmer's legs. Some of them look as though they're speaking to them. Another woman very distant in the background looks as though she's giving a really nice hip massage and they are all very, very close together to one another. And in the background, you can see these really lovely skyline buildings. So it's obvious that it's on a nice high level. It's on a rooftop somewhere. Beautiful. Thank you, Sydney. That's really nice. You bring out some of the care qualities that are going on in the image, which I'm really glad you did. So yeah, this is a, this is a theater conference and we're kind of breaking those usual ways that people are together with, with one another in a conference by having people prepare swimmers for going into the water. So we're creating care rituals. We're inventing care rituals to prepare people for the experience of going under. Maybe this one last one. This is a slide that again has some text on it. And the text is Salamander Neve, Neve, who is a, a they, he, a preferred pronouns, identifies as a disabled, multi-gender femme, mixed race, black African choreographer. Okay, and you might have seen Neve's work with um, Axis Dance. Uh, Neve was, a, um, was one of their fellows, I think about a year or so ago. So you might have seen some of their work through that or in other ways. So really beautiful, um, a person with a beautiful disability culture choreography sensibility. Would someone like to audio describe what they see here in Neves' image? Don't have a volunteer, so I'm just audio describing that I see a person floating beneath the water, half reflected in the water, the water surface that is, that is above them. And we see sort of brown, red hair drifting below the water. It gives us a sense of this alternate gravity, a different reality that, that this person is in. The person is wearing a bikini top and under the bikini top are all these tattoos. And there also is a beautiful facial ta tattoo, like a moko. Uh, on, on their forehead and they're wearing a nose ring and they have a very kind of very tender smile on their lips and their eyes are closed. Okay. All right. So I think that's enough on the salamander. Maybe I end with this one. That's a, a, the Swedish one. It's one of the Swedish ones. So this is from, um, again, this is a slide without text and I can audio describe this one quickly. You, um, this is from the Swedish island that I talked about from 2016. And you see there two power chair users from the back. You see five people overall. Everybody's with the back to the camera. And these people are sitting in front of an oceanscape. So they're on an accessible boardwalk uh, that is laid out over the sand, which, you know, as a wheelchair user, that's where my eye goes first. I see, oh, I can actually get close because there is a boardwalk that's really close into the, into the beach because my wheelchair doesn't work on sand, of course. And if you look closely between the two wheelchairs, there's actually a ramp that goes down and a handrail that goes down into the ocean. So this is an amazing accessible island where you can, as a wheelchair user, get all the way into the ocean itself. 
through various accessible means. T two of us have wheelchair, we have uh, um, e-wear wheelchairs, electro wheelchairs, and I'm the one in the middle. So the person with the shaved head and the blue bag in the middle is is myself, and then one of the um, uh, audience members is next to me and the other people are also audience members looking out at the horizon and we're thinking together about the draw of the ocean and about immigration and, and emigration from Sweden in this moment. We have a little score about thinking about what comes up as we're standing on the edge of the ocean. Okay, and I'll leave it with that. Thank you. This is Sydney. Thank you for, so much for taking us through that project and also for leading us a little bit through audio description. I know you and I have discussed before how we think audio description really is a part of disability culture and how it, having it as part of the artistic practice makes the work even richer. Mm -hmm. Discussing a little bit more about the Salamander Project, if that's okay with you, Petra. Sure. I, I am interested in it. It was really beautiful when you were talking about creating this culture of care. And I am curious as to, I think that there might be some relationship between that and this repetition that is happening in multiple spaces with multiple bodies. Can you discuss the connections and also the importance of those two? Yeah. Um, yes. So um, I think one of the important things is that the fact that this is there is a set structure that's also very easy to get your head around. You know, it's not complicated. It doesn't shift much and it ends in a picnic. You know, I mean, that is, it makes it more accessible because even if you yourself might not want to do it first time around because like, ooh, scary, you hear, you might hear from friends who've done it that it's this very easy step scene and it ends on having a picnic. <laughs> and it, it, it gives it, it gives it more, I think, uh, 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 an easier, it gives easier access. It allows more people to access it, not just people who might be terrified of going swimming together. I mean, there's that, right? Many, many people do not wish to expose their bodies, for instance, to the binary of the male and female changing rooms, you know, like not many places have trans-friendly spaces. Um, they might not wish to expose themselves to the stare of others on very, very vulnerable bodies that are often very differently shaped. So there are many different reasons why it might take people a while to participate. We also always have dry salamanders. You know, there's always an option to stay out of the water and to just support people like you saw in the, in the image from Texas. That was the, the Texan rooftops um, where people might read text written, some of the audio description or poems that developed from audio descriptions uh, of the salamanders to the people who are going into the water. So that's a very important support structure too. So there are all these different positions and the repetition creates safety. The repetition creates access. And the repetition can also create what I talked about earlier, right? This trans state, right? because you know that you're safe, you know what you're doing, you can give yourself to it. So if we just go talk together and then go down together, talk together, go down together, it creates a lovely rhythm, I think. That's the end of my thought. This is Sydney. Really like the ways that you describe how the, the repetition continues to create access, mm -hmm. but also how that access is part of the aesthetic. I think that really holds up the importance of considering and creating disability culture spaces within a dance environment. And I really enjoyed that. I do want to know a little bit more about your movement practice. And so I'm wondering if you could discuss your studio, Turtle Disco, and that you share with your partner. And if you could talk about these amoeba workshops um, and how it's been to teach them virtually, since I'm sure some of the people on this call right now have also been teaching virtually. Exactly. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So, wow. Huh? All this, this virtual teaching, 15 months of it. It's kind of amazing. So Turtle Disco started in 2017. Uh, Stephanie, my, my wife, Stephanie Haidt, and myself, um, we wanted to create an alternative to the international circuit. So as, as you already heard, I, I travel a lot. Um, 
And I wanted to travel a little bit less, um, first of all, to also to nourish the wider community of disability culture artists out there. So it's not just the same name, it's names that keep popping up again and again, uh, but also because of you know climate change and specifically because um, I got really fascinated by a theorist called Donna Haraway and her in, in her book, um, uh, Staying with the Trouble, um, at the eighth chapter, she talks about, she uses a creative writing experiment where she thinks about how humans and non-humans can merge, humans and in this particular case, like a butterfly, a monarch butterfly. Um, and she's, the setup for the scene is that after the apocalypse, people come together in small groups and find new ways of living together and new ways that then shift from the old ways of being together. So for me, disability culture is one of these ways in which new ways can come forward. And I just really wanted to think, stay with the experiment of doing something really local. So when we started Dodo Disco, it was all here about this little place, this you know little town, Rust Belt town of Ypsilanti. Many people could just walk to us or bicycle to us. Uh, people came from maybe as far as an Arbor, but mainly it was a very local practice. And it was a friendship building practice. So we, we did activities together. We did movement work and writing work, but we also went to lots of local museums together. We went to lots of like local, uh, you know, nice places that one wants to go to and just did again, picnicking, art practice and picnicking. And then of course the pandemic hit, so things shifted. So now it's not local. It is on Zoom, which means local to lots of people. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it was actually, we've had a lot more people involved, which was not the, it was not the point, right? It wasn't the point of Dota to have lots of people. The point was to create a local network of support and friendship. But now we have an international network of support and friendship. And it's, it's very sweet. It's a lovely, lovely network where people come from diff, all kinds of different continents, really. And, and the core practice we do in online Toto Disco is, I want to show you a picture of that because I do have that here. Just a minute. Back to share screen. Share. Okay, so here's one of them. And I asked them, I asked them for permission to record them. <laughs> so I can use it in these kinds of talks. So this is our core practice in Total Disco Online. It's a weekly practice. It's a cafe clutch. Um, and I think many of you probably know what a cafe clutch is. It's a German word, but it means coffee and cake, right? So uh, it's a very low-key hangout space. It's like the old, an alternative to the salon, which is usually wine and cheese, right? So this is the non-alcoholic version of it, <laughs> cafe clutch. And so these beautiful people that you see here, which involves, let me audio describe, we see Chanika Svedvilas, who is a Thai American artist, uh, who is, is a visual artist. Desiree Malimu Bangs is a, is a kind of video art, is a video artist. She's, she's here with a, her beautiful Afro is filling the screen. She's very joyful and smiling. Next to her is someone called Megan Kaminsky, who has, who's a, a white woman uh, who has a pussycat on her lap, who's always part of these, of these sessions. She's a poet. Uh, Kalia is a native Hawaiian person, and they are, they are smiling at us with long, dark hair flowing down the sides of their face. And next to that is Leora Amir, who's from the Bay Area. Um, and, and she's also smiling with us with um, her glasses on and her curly, her curly, her curly hair sh uh, shaping around her face. So that's, that's part of the crew. These are some of the people who show up. And in this check-in, we talk about our creative lives. So everybody on the screen, as far as I, yeah, I'm pretty certain everybody around the screen, ident oh yeah, I forgot to describe my wife up here. That's, it. That's where the, um, the Zoom thing is. So next, and at the top right, you see my wife, Stephanie, who's leaning into the camera with her short bob hair. And, and of course, there's me. So, um, so we come together and we, we just, we talk about our creative lives. So how are we being creative? And, um, and that is, is, can be a very deep sharing. So we just, we, we divide up the time we have by the people who show up and then people can just talk freely about what's going on with them. You know, what are, what's going on for them in their creative practice. And it's, it's a really beautiful, it was, it was just a lifesaver during the pandemic. We started that in, 
April 2020, you know, just after things had shut down here in the U.S. and we're still doing it. At the beginning, we really did it weekly because many of us just didn't see anybody else. This was our social life, you know, where many people just didn't have too much else going on. So it was a wonderful way of just sustaining ourselves as disabled artists. Okay, and that's something else. I'll stop sharing. So, and in terms of dance practice, we do um, the amoeba dances that you mentioned, which is a practice informed by something called continuum movement uh, and by Pauline Oliveros' uh, music work. And I'm going to, I can actually share the screen again there. I actually have all these names written down because I, I knew that we needed that for access. Here we go. This is it. Okay, so here's the amoeba dances slide. And on there, I have written down the names I just mentioned. Uh, Emily Conrad Daoud, who's the founder of Continuum Movement. I mentioned here the West Coast Contact Improvisation Festival, which I think is the festival where I first got to know uh, Jess Curtis and, um, and Keith Hennessy. Uh, Terry Carter and Robin Becker. Another influence is an artist called Martina Ramirez, who is an outsider artist who was incarcerated and institutionalized, a Mexican artist who was institutionalized in the US um, psych institution. And Pauline Oliveros, who's a lesbian music pioneer and who, who came up with this super sonorous and beautiful concept called deep listening. And here's a picture of Pauline here on the left and here in the middle, here's me in my wheelchair again. I just love that I have a picture of Pauline and me because she's really an important ancestress for many of us. Um, okay. And so here's an image of how, why I'm fascinated with Martina Ramirez. So I have here a slide that says Martina Ramirez and crip adaptability. And I talk about crip adaptability because Ma um, Ramirez was, as I said, Mexican. He was for 30 years institutionalized. He was a self-taught artist and he painted on whatever he could lay his hands on. So on some of these images, and you can just about see it in this image here, you see some creases. The image shows tunnel-like structures, you know, like, uh, wave structures, black and white, with a touch of red on a brown paper background. And you see some creases in this, this material because it's likely the lining of a drawer. You know, so he just used whatever he could get his hands on. As someone who was institutionalized, he didn't have any arts materials un until he was, you know, kind of found, sort of like found and discovered as an outsider artist. For the longest time, he had to make do with what he had. So Crip adaptability was very much part of um, the aesthetic framework of his work and also I think of Toto Disco work. So when we are in our Toto Disco amoeba dance, we dive, we, we use sounds to open up tunnels inside our bodies. And then we very gently move with the resonance of these tunnels. And what I just described likely made absolutely no sense to anybody. Right. I mean, it's just it's impossible to describe because it's a sensation. And if you're OK with that, I'm just going to take you through one tiny exercise. There. So let's drop an O into ourselves. OK. And with a dropping of an O, I mean, normally when you say O, it goes outwards. Right. So everybody, we can't see you. You're not on the screen. So and you can't hear we can't hear you either. But just say O and see go outwards. O going outwards. And now take that same O and drop it inward. It sounds like, oh, oh, okay, those I can see, give me a sense. Do you get that a little bit? Do you get a little sense of that? Does it fall inward? Excellent, thank you, Sally, thank you, thank you, Silva, thank you, Sydney. So now let's do a little bit more of that. And as you take that O in, let it vibrate through your tissues. And then as it vibrates into your tissue, see if there's a response from your body somewhere, anywhere, like a little shiver, something that might open up as you put sound, as you undense your body. So, oh. 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 All right, 
just giving you a tiny hint of that. And you can play with that by yourself. And I use this a lot when I'm in a lot of pain. I, I have um, the condition that I have means that I think of it as crystals around my joints, you know, so inflamed crystal geodes around my joints. And I use this breath and these O tunnels to open up some space between me and the pain. I send my breath into these joints and imagine that there's a cave wind that's running through that takes some of the inflammation away, that takes some of the pain away. And then as I do that, I find my joint becoming more mobile. I'm often on the ground lying down and I feel that I can reach differently. I see what happens as I let it run down my spine. So it's both a pain treatment for me. I mean, I use it as a pain relieving mechanism and also as a generator of movement, very small movements, but it's a technique form that you can then use to build on and create bigger work with. Right? So that's, that's like one example of what we're doing in amoeba dances. That was a long answer. <laughs> the end of my thought. <laughs> No, it was a lovely answer. And it was, I think it's so lovely to take time to move together, especially at this point in the conversation. I think it's nice to remind us to come back to our bodies. And with that, we are running short on time. So I wanted to open it up to the audience if anyone had any questions for Petra. If not, I have some additional questions that I can ask, but if anyone would like to unmute or type it into the chat or ask the interpreter to voice for you, any of those are wonderful. I'll just give it a moment. Mm -hmm. That's fine. And while you're waiting, you can always drop some O's into yourself. Or you can hum and see what happens when you hum and how that can create vibrations in your body and how your body responds to that. This is Sally speaking. Um, I'm uh, white and uh, long curly hair and I'm sitting and I have a a turquoise dress on and a turquoise necklace, a necklace with a stone in it from Finland. And um, it's not a question, but I just want to say what a pleasure. Like, I, I feel like I'm in a state of pleasure of listening mm. to the conversation and, and just because the practice or what I'm receiving is the practice that is so body based that that, you know, it's like the water, it kind of comes through. And I'm just saying here that I'm enjoying that end of the thought. <laughs> <laughs> Sally's stopping speaking. Thank you for sharing that, Sally. If we don't have any questions, I do have another question for you, Petra. You know, we briefly talked about how at the Turtle Disco, you are teaching online in the Amoeba workshops, but I know that there's been a lot of other things that you've been doing. And I wish that, I was wondering if you could share some of the other small embodied practices that you've been sharing with the community. And I know I'll put a few of my favorites and an upcoming one that you're doing in the chat. That's lovely. That's lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see, which one should I talk about? I want to talk about the melt. Okay. So um, I am associated with movement research, which is a um, contemporary dance research organization out of New York City. And I have been associated with them for, yeah, thank you, for, um, for quite a while now, quite a few years uh, in the past, I have gone out to, I'm, I live in rural Michigan. I'm a rural artist. I don't normally work in the city much um, because cities tend to be very inaccessible for me, particularly New York City, where not even the subway is accessible. So, you know, strike that. Don't need to work in, in New York City much. At the same time, there's many, many wonderful artists in New York City. And so occasionally I go on a trip and run a workshop. And I do this at Movement Research. And twice now, Stephanie, my wife and I together have led 
um, uh, workshops there that are site specific where we, we, we usually start in the studio, but then we visit with different sites and, and create movement responses, engage, you know, the population that happens to be hanging out in a particular playground or dance by the side of the East river. Um, so there's many different ways that we have having have engaged the actual physical space usually of the east village in uh, and east side in new york city um but now in pandemic times i've started teaching in the meld program and some of you might have heard of meld it's been going on for a really long time it's originally called melt because if you happen to be in july and august in new york city you're going to melt you know so <laughs> um, I, I never really been there because it sounds like sounds kind of hard to me, uh, but online works fine for me. So I taught. They also have winter melts. So I taught first a melt workshop in January, and we just had this lovely, lovely um, uh, week called home home launch. And it was magical because I had disabled people from, I had many art dancers come, not just disabled people, but particularly I had disabled people come from around the world, you know, because movement research is well known and they have a beautiful reach. And I had these wonderful disabled dancers from Colombia, from, uh, from Australia. I mean, just all kinds of wonderful people showed up. And, and that's just the amazing thing about the online environment. We can be together, even if we can't be together. If I'm in New York, I can't get into 90% of the studios. You know, most of the studios are completely and utterly inaccessible. And, and also I can't get there because it takes me an hour or two hours to cross the city. So now I am able to participate in these lovely workshops. So that was home launch where we used our sofas, our beds, our, if, you know, if we have space, then our floor as launch pads to start moving together. And I, I, that idea kind of came from um, another ancestor, Gloria Anzaldúa. Maybe, Sydney, you can put that into the chat for me or someone. Gloria Anzaldúa is, um, she was a Chicana theorist who wrote about writing and theorizing from her bed. You know, so it's a very disability culture way of being active in the world to think about how, what influence you can do from your bed, from a resting place, if you have pain, if you can't get out. So in launch pad, we just assumed that as the basis. And then we went into these science fiction scenarios through our movements. We did a lot of breakouts where we had one-on-one -on -one improvisations. We went on movement meditation journeys together. It was really fun. And the one that's coming up now, I'm gonna teach in the summer's melt, uh, the, um, Starship somatics. So that's also Zoom. I'm not quite sure yet what I'm going to do, but it will involve starships <laughs> and um, it will involve some of the kind of patterns I've already described to you, but also uh, again, movement meditations. So I have I've long worked with people by leading meditations that have movement instructions embedded in them. And you can either do these movement practices full out and actually move in space, or it can be an internal practice. And this practice started out in my work with uh, mental health system survivors who were asked to perform for the services that, um, that paid for you know, the kinds of structures that, that they're using. And no one felt really interested in performing because people had often depot medication, you know, medication that was put in their bodies often against their wills and that created tremors, for instance, you know, people who have long-term mental health issues and significant ones often find that the medication has really physical effects on them. So it's hard, it's stumbling, it's hard to find balance. So people felt that they couldn't really participate in what's conventionally called dance because of, you know, internalized ableism and shame about their bodies. And so we found other ways. We just took instead the audience on a meditation journey and they could just watch the people who wanted to do this lying and just in being deeply embodied with barely moving, just breathing, but breathing freely while hearing this meditation journey that the audiences were invited to go on, on with them. And so that kind of practice is still really central to my, my way of working. Like that's withholding the gaze. If I talked earlier about seducing people into doing something with us, in this case, because of the desires of the people I was working with, 
we withdrew the gaze, but invited a different kind of seduction, a seduction to just do it with us. So that's one of these examples of doing it together in virtual space. That's the end of my thought. Well, thank you for all of that, Petra. And I'm going to put another link in the chat if you want to look at more about Petra's work and what she's doing. I also put a few other links in the chat and I hope you are able to check those out later. But we are at 10 o'clock and I am mindful of our access services and everyone's time. I know that people are from all around the world. And so some of you are going to be heading to bed while Petra and I are beginning our morning. Oops. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sydney, Petra, and interpreter. Thank you, thank you for this conversation. I will be emailing uh, the links to all of the participants, so don't worry if you didn't get them. And I want to just add one more link. Check out the rest of the X Dance Festival 20, 2021 offerings. We have all kinds of amazing things, like you can sign up for uh, watch the latest work of Vertigo, Power of Balance, Shape on Us, and then hear them in a conversation later in the week. Thank you Thank again. You. Thank you, everybody. It was wonderful. Thank you, Sydney, for the beautiful questions. Thank you, everybody, for the invite. And it's great to move virtually with you. And maybe we get to move with each other one of these days, which would be wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Petra. Thanks, Mad Maggie. Thank you all.